So welcome to the second class of computing fundamentals and today we will discuss sets and then we will speak about functions, sequences and some and matrices. And in this chapter we will focus more of, about the language of set. Today specifically in this class we will speak about sets and their operation and their identity. Then by the coming weeks we'll discuss functions and sequences and summarization. So we will focus about how we define a set in math and then how we can describe them based on a mathematical quantifier. And then we will discover or recall some important sets that we know from um, the time we were in school. Uh, then we will discuss what we mean by empty set and universal set. Then we will study the cardinality of sets and then the Cartesian product of sets. So first, what we mean by sets? They are one of the basic building blocks for discrete mathematics and uh, they are very important in computer science because a database, any table in the database is basically a set. Any Python list is a set. Do you know Python list? It is a set. Now, you also you can extend this further and you say any Python dictionary is al um, as well a set. And they are very important for a programming language and the set operation, we always use set operation to find out, for example, how many students score more than 90 in Computing Fundamentals 1 because basically you do a join between two tables and this join is basically an intersection between two sets. Now set theory is a very important branch of mathematics and many different systems have used sets to define the relationship between um, different entities, elements and objects. So a set is an ordered collection of objects. And objects could be anything. Now, this could be the students in this class. It also could be the chairs in the room. Now, the objects in the set are called the elements or the members of the set. And normally, the relationship between the set and its members, it's basically containing. So a set contains those members. Now, the notion where we have the small a, normally a small a, the character small a, belongs to the capital A, donates that this element, this is small element a, is basically an element of the set capital A. So if a is not a member of capital A, we write it basically a not belongs to uh, A. It's not an element of A. So how you would describe a set? You can use this notation for describing the set S where it's equal and then you donate in the set all the members inside it. So A, B, C, D, all are elements of the big set S. Now, in set theory, in the order of those elements, how they appear in the set, representation is not important. Because basically, the above set, S, where A comes first, is similarly equal to B, C, A, and D. And this is what we call equality relationship, which I don't believe it's a true equality, because this is basically a similarity. Because you are talking about a set with the same elements that is similar in the structure with another set with the same element. And we will discuss this in details in the coming um, uh, few slides. Now, in the set, each distinct object is either a member or not. <coughs> so you always have like a list of all the members in the set and you donate them by this notation. So you sometimes use the ellipses instead, or the parentheses, so you have all the members when the pattern is clear. The relationship between those elements is clear. Like 
This set contains all students in age between 20 to 25. This is what we mean by the relationship. So it will appear like you know the rest of it, like etc, etc, etc. So you know the rest of the set, which, which one should be a member or not a member of the set. Now example of sets, like let's say the set of vowels in English. V, capital V, equals to A, E, I, O, and U. Now, the set of all positive, um, all positive integers, less than 10. Now here I define the relationship between the numbers less than 10. So basically we have one, which is an odd positive integer. This is like the relationship between the elements in the set. Now three is as well an odd positive integer and it's also less than number 10. Now take for example the set of all positive integer less than 100. Basically here I know that one is a positive integer less than 100, two is as well a positive integer less than 100, three, etc., etc., up to 99. And this is where you can use the ellipses, just the dots, to explain that the relationship between those elements is going to be the same. So we are talking here about a set where all elements have a homogeneous relationship. So they are, the elements are homogeneous. Normally we call them homogeneous because there is a mathematical relationship between them. Now, if they have... Sometimes you have a set with elements which are heterogeneous, which means they are like distributed. There is no relationship between them, but they come to happen in the same set. Another example, you can say the set of all integer less than zero. So S, for example, including minus a three, minus two, minus one. Now, everything before those numbers is given by the relationship I just defined. Now, some important sets that you need to recall and remember for this class. Uh, the capital N, which is basically stand for natural m I mean numbers, where we start with zero. By the way, <coughs> we call them natural because we find them in nature. You can find one tree, zero tree, one tomato, zero tomato, and so on. So you can measure them in nature. But you have the other set, which is capital Z, which donates all integers numbers, including positive and negative values. <coughs> and it's also including zero. By the way, zero was an invention. It was like a, something they, they discovered later on, like many, many years after inventing Z, the set theory. Now, when you speak about Z positive, Z plus, capital Z plus, this stands for positive integer, not including the zero. Now, R is the set of real numbers where we have a fraction, 1.5, 2.5, and so on. Now, R plus is the positive real number because the previous one contains minus 2.5, minus 0.5, and so on. Now, C and Q are a set of complex number. Complex number is the number where you can obtain by the notation A plus B multiplied by I, where I is a real number. We don't really worry now how a complex number obtained, but this is how we call the set of complex number. And also we have capital Q, which stands for rational number. Now, the easiest way to remember all of these type of sets is just to draw them in the, in the notation you see here in the slide where we have a small n. Now, look, z is containing all the big set of n is contained in the set z capital. The set q, for example, the set of rational number contain everything, including integers, including positive integers, including as well complex number, and R as well is a set of real numbers which contains every other set in those examples. Now how you can build or define a set? Let me give you some examples. 
So you normally specify the relationship between the elements of the set using a quantifier. So if you want to describe a positive integer less than 100, you can use the quantifier relationship where you say the set S capital equals to X, where X is positive integer less than 100. So this is the relationship. So anything which satisfy this rule would be an element of this set S. Now, the set O is basically has an element called X where X is an odd positive integer less than 10. So any number positive and odd is an element of the set O. So this is including 3, 5, 7, 1, 9. But it will not include, for example, uh, minus 1 or minus 3 because I define the relationship to be a positive odd integer. It will never contain any real number as well. You can also include everything in the big set like Z plus where you say O is a set where X belongs to the Z capital plus, all positive <coughs> integers. So X is an odd and X should be less than 10. This is like you refine it, like you refine the generic definition. You don't take all numbers in Z plus and you define them by a specific relationship. So a predicate could be used to describe the element of the set as well, based on the notation a set like S capital has an element which is X. And this X could be defined by the function P of X. Now you can define this function further and you say, for example, the positive rational number Q plus is a set. I have element in this set called X and this X belongs to the set capital R, which is real numbers, positive and negative, where we have X as well equals to P divided by Q. Now P and Q as well positive integer. So I am exactly specifying which one should be qualified to be in this set. So the interval notation, you could also use interval, okay, with the square brackets, just to explain the elements of the set. Instead of quantifier, you could say, for example, there is a set has an element A and B, and this set could be defined. Those elements in the set could be described using this mathematical notation. X is the element in the set, and this X is basically greater than the value of a greater, less than or equal the value of B. So this set is including an interval. So for example, this set contains all the elements from two to five. So this means three is a greater than or equal two and less than or equal five. So it should be an element in this set. So any notation or any of these symbols could be used, whether you close the parentheses, which means it's a closed set, it's not an interval, or you uh, make a square bracket to, to donate that this is an interval. It's not the complete set. It's a range of value, okay? It's a range of value. So normally a closed interval will be with square brackets and open interval will be with parentheses. Now the easiest notation that we could use to simplify or to present sets, we call it um, the Venn diagram. Now how we can speak about this? Now imagine that there is like universal set called U capital, which contains every atom in the universe. It will contain everything you could believe or think about. This is like the largest set you could ever think about. <laughs> it will have real numbers, integers, stars, galaxies, whatever you think is there in this big set. Chairs, students, cars, anything. So anything you could consider or you could measure in math could be an element in this big U. 
<coughs> now there is as well another set called phi or the empty set because there is no element in it and we normally use the phi character to donate an empty set <coughs> So if you look to the Venn diagram, this is how you represent, for example, the set of U, which is basically everything available under consideration. And this is like the big V capital, the small set which contains the vowel characters in English. And it will contain like a small portion of it. So this is how you would represent it. So for example, let S capital be the set of all sets which are not members of themselves. Okay? Now, the result from trying to answer this question is S capital a member of itself. Now, you can rephrase this question by saying Henry is a barber and who shaves all people who do not shave themselves. Now, the result from trying to answer this question, does Henry shave himself? So this would answer the question that basically the set S could be a member of itself. But by the definition, S is a set of all sets which are not member of themselves. So by definition, this S is not member of itself. Okay? So by definition, S is not a member of itself. So a set can be elements of another set. So for example, the set 1, 2, 3 is an element of another larger set where it is also an element with A and another small subset called B and C. And then you have another set called N capital Z, capital Q capital and R capital, which is, you can call it, W. Now, the, uh, the empty set is different from any other set because it's containing the empty set phi. And phi is also an element of every other set exists. Now, how you could define that two sets like A and B are equal? Again, it's not like the normal equality we use in math where we have one equal one. No, it will be similarity, which means does the first set contains all elements and those <coughs> elements cont are contained in the second set. So basically, a set equality, two sets are equal if and only if, okay? And if and only if now, it's really important to focus on, they have the same elements. So the same elements are both exist in both sets. So if A and B are sets, then A and B are equal if and only if there is X, okay? For all X now, there is one X belongs to A if and only if X as well belongs to B. So we could write A equal B if and only if a and B are equal sets based on the definition, we can see here that when the first set, which is A, contains the element 1, contains the 3, 5. Now the second set as well contains the 3, 5, and 1. Now look to the second example. The first set A has the element 1, 5, 3, 3, 1, and the second one is 1, 3, and 5. Are they equal? Yes. <coughs> Because basically here, both elements are satisfying the relationship. So one belongs to A if and only if one belongs to B. A three belongs to A if and only if belongs to B. Five belongs to A if and only if belongs to B. So it could Now, what we mean by subsets? There is a set called A, and it will be a subset of the set capital B if and only if 
every element now of A is also an element of B. But this is not necessarily means that the elements of B should exist in A. This means the set B could have more elements than the set A, and still set A is a subset of set B. So the notion A capital is a subset of B is used to indicate the subset relationship, and A is a subset of B holds exactly when they have if and only if there is an X which bas basically belongs to A, then belongs to B. Now here we are not doing if and only if, and the reason why we do this because it might be possible that there is an element called X and this X belongs to B, but it does not belong to A. And this is why we have the use the relationship if then, not if only if. If we say if only if, so this definition will be an equality. It will not be a subset definition. So because an element like small a belongs to the set phi, which is always false, phi is also a subset of big S for every set of S. And this is what we say, the empty set is an element of every other set. Because A is belongs to capital S, then A belongs to S, then S is a subset of S. The same set could be a subset of itself for every set of S, which is basically satisfy the condition. We satisfy the first part, which is F then. If S or is a subset, then S is a subset of S. You could show that a set is not a subset of another set by saying A is a subset of B. You need to have one X which belongs to A, then the same X is also belongs to B. Now, to show that A is not a subset of B, you can just do that when you find one element in X, in A, one element in A, where basically the same element does not exist in B. So for example, the set of all computer science majors at your school is a subset of all students at your school. That's a true one. Now the set of integers with the squares less than 100 is not a subset of the set of non-negative integer, that's a false one. You could also look to equality in sets by saying A equal B if and only if there is X where X belongs to A if and only if X belongs to B. And you can use logical equivalence, the same one we covered in the previous week where we say for all of X, there is X belongs to A, then X belongs to B, and this could be translated to and x belongs to b then x belongs to a now if you do this the same use the same logical equivalence law for the relationship of subset you cannot end up with this and relationship so here you have to satisfy the condition that x is an element of a then x is an element of b and also x as an element of b then there is an x element of A. <coughs> so if we have A, which is a subset of B, but A is not equal to B, then we say that A is a proper subset of B, and we donate it by the notation A, a proper subset of B, and then for all of X, now the relationship is different, because here for all of X, there is an X, belongs to A, then it belongs to B. Now the only exception we have, and there is one X, there is one small X in B, and it's not in A. But you can just simplify it using Venn diagram where you have the universal set U, the big square you can see here in the diagram, and you have a small subset of B called A. 
and there is as well the set B. Now this is a proper set of B. A here is a proper set, subset of the big set B. But it's not covering all the element. It just covers a small portion of the big set. So we can also use cardinality relationship as an operation over sets. So if there is exactly an indistinct element in any set like S, where we have a definition for N as a, a non-negative integer, we say that S is finite, otherwise it is infinite. Now, the cardinality of a finite set like A donated by the absolute value of A is the number of distinct elements of A. And this is where you remove duplication from the finite set. And that's why in databases in SQL, in MySQL, or in any database implemented in computer science, we always deal with finite number of sets because we don't like duplication. We try to get rid from duplication. We try to do normalization to remove all the duplicate values in any table. So for example, the cardinality of the empty set is zero. The cardinality of the set one, two, three is basically three. The cardinality of phi equal one and the set of integer is infinite. Now also there is an, uh, the third or the fourth example of sets called power set where we have all subset of a set like A donated by P of A is called the power set of A. And this satisfies the condition where we have A has an element, a small A and a small B. Then the power of A, which is the combination of all elements in this set, it will be phi because phi is an element of any set. It will be the small A alone it will be B alone, and it will be A and B together, because A and B is a subset of that set. So the cardinality of any set based on this could be two to the power N, where N is the number of elements you find in any set. There is a famous concept we use in computer science when we deal with computer databases, which is a tuple, which is a record, a row of data. Normally, we call it a tuple in databases. Why? The reason for that, because we are talking about an ordered number of elements in a set, where we have A1, A2, up to AN. And normally, this is what you find in any database. You will find, for example, if you have a student database, you will have a student table. And in that table, you will have one single row where it contains the student number, student name, student last name, student email, and then student grade in computing fundamentals one, which is 40, which is a pass. Now, when there is two tuples are equal if and only if there is a corresponding element are equal. And this is what we call in computer science inner join, where the, there is exact match between the elements of the first row with the element in the second row. Sometimes we use the concept of order the tuple, normally with key value pair. Uh, for example, in JSON file and XML. So you will find an order pair where you will have, for example, first name, Basil, second name, Magabi, email, something, and so on. You will find an order pair where we have a key and a value. And we call a tuple is an ordered pair, A and B and C and D are equal if they satisfy the following relationship. If and only if A equals to C, B equal to D. Now, you need to find an exact match between the keys and the values. And this is how JSON processing or parsing normally works. Final operation of sets, which is very important to focus on, which is the Cartesian product. What we mean by Cartesian product? The Cartesian product of two sets a and B capital donated by A multiplied by B is the set of ordered pair A, B, 
where A now belongs to A capital and B belongs to B capital. In this case, you will take all the elements A and B where you satisfy the relationship. So the first pair should be the first pair of the result of the Cartesian product should be small a with a small b, small a2 with a small b2, and so on. Now, this is what we call in databases natural join, because we do just Cartesian product between two tables, and we basically blend them together. All the elements of the two sets are blended with each other. Now, take an example. If you have an A set capital, where we have the small element A small B small, and we have another set called B capital, it has one, two, three as an element. Now, let me take one by one between both sets, and I will just combine them in an ordered pair. So I will take A from A capital, one from B. A from A, two from B. A from A, three from B. B from A, one, and so on. So B1, B2, B3. Now the last information you will find about Cartesian product, if you have a subset called capital R, this subset from the result of the Cartesian product A multiplied by B is called a relation for the set A to the set B, which is basically what we do in databases as normalization. First normal form and second normal form is basically used in computer science to filter and to just tune the data in the table using the definition of the Cartesian product. So once you think about Cartesian product, you will find about a small subset, A capital 1, A capital 2, and so on, where we have A small 1, A small 2, all the way to A of N, where A of I now is an element of A capital of I for loop, basically from I equal 1 to N. So the Cartesian product of the sets from A1 capital to A of N is the set of ordered tuples where you have now ordered tuples, not ordered pair, okay? Where we have A1, A2, A of N, where A of I basically a loop from I equal what to N. Now the result from this will be simple to see it in the example. So let me explain the example first, then we'll go back to the actual definition. So if you have A multiplied by B multiplied by C, where A is 0, 1, B is 1, 2, and C is 0, 1, 2. Now take every element from every set and just blend them with each other. So I will take 0 from A, then 1 from B, then I will take 0 from C. Then I will take 0 from A, then 1 from B, then I will take 1 from C. Then I will take 0 from A, 1 from B, and then I will take 2 from C. And so on. So I will match every element in A, B, C with every other element in the other sets to make a tubule of data where we have different formation from a mix from each element in the set. The last thing before we start our activity is basically, if you have a predicate like B capital, and which is basically a mathematical definition, a mathematical description describing a rule, and a domain D, and domain D could be the universal set, the big set that contains everything in universe. Uh, we define the truth set of B capital to be the set of elements in D, for which p of x is true. Now here we are talking about p of x as a function that should be true in terms of logic. So the truth set of p of x is donated by an x is an element of d where it satisfies the function p of x or it is a true value 
when the function b of x is exist. As an example, p of x, where the domain is the integers. Now, if p of x is an absolute value of x, the positive value of any number, equal 1, then the set minus 1 and 1 both satisfy the rule. Both satisfy p of x. So those two values make function p of x true. Now, let us do this activity together. Now, with set operations, we have a specific operations that we can use with sets and the elements of the sets. So we'll speak about how we can make a union between two sets, how we make intersection, and how we can complement a set and find the difference between two sets. So with propositional calculus and the set theory, both are basically an instance of an algebraic system, which is called Boolean algebra. It is the same that you use in logical design in the digital circuit of the computer motherboard. So the same operator you would use in the set theory are corresponding to the same operator that you use in a propositional calculus, which is an algebra. So as always, there must be a universal set U that contains every single element that you can consider, or you can sense, or you can think about. So let us first take what we mean by the union of two sets. The merge between sets, two sets, means that there is an element called X. And in this case, X is an element of the set capital A and, sorry, or is an element of the set B. So any element in both sets will be merged, will be taken into the union. So there is a union between sets. This means that you merge them and you make a larger set of both sets. So if you have an A and B capital sets, the union will be donated by the symbol upside down horseshoe, which is A union B. Now, the mathematical definition of it, as we said, x is an element of A or x is an element of B. Now, when you change the or to and, it will be an intersection. It will not be a union. Take, for example, what you can see now as an element of the set A, 1, 2, 3. Make union of this set with another set with the element three, four, and five. The result of this merge, the result of this union will be one, two, three, four, and five. Now, you might be asking, three appears in both sets. Do I need to duplicate it? No, you don't. You don't need to duplicate it because this means that the three is an element of B and element of A, and it will appear on the union between A and B. Now, when you think about intersection, you are thinking about a common factors or a common elements between two sets. So basically, you can define it by mathematical definition X, where X is an element of A, and it should be an element of B. And we know what AND means. The truth table of AND means X should be true as an element of A, and it also should be true for an element in B. As an example now, with the same set that we just merged in the previous example, now let us find a common factor between them, a common element. You will find that one is in A, but not in B. Two is in A, but not in B. Three is in A, and it is in B, so this is a common element. So this is li like the result of intersection. 4 is not in A, but it is an element of B. And 5 is not in A, but it is an element in, in B.
Now, the same. Take another example. What is the intersection between the set 1, 2, 3 and 4, 5, 6? There is no common factor. There is one single common factor between them. We said that phi, the empty set, is an element of any set. So phi is the only element between them. <coughs> now there is another type of relationship between sets called complement. It is the same when you take a binary code and you take the complement of the binary code. So what we mean by a complement? If we have a set A, then the complement of A, A prime, is donated by a dash, that little prime co um, symbol there, is the set where you have the universal set, everything we could think about, minus that A. This is what we mean by the complement of A. So, in this case, the definition of the complement x should belongs to you and by the definition everything belongs to you where now this x should not be an element of a so if you now now i will define what we mean by you because you could be defined or could stand for any set if you now donate the positive integer less than 100 what is the complement of the set where x is greater than or equal 70. This means anything, anything greater than 70 is already an element of the set A. The A complement is basically anything less than or equal 70. So you take U minus A. And when you when you describe it in the Venn diagram, you will see that the big square stand for the universal set, and now you represent the set A, and everything outside this circle, inside the square, is basically the complement of A. There is another type of definition, which is called the difference between uh, A and B. Now, don't mix the difference with intersection because intersection is a common factor now here we are looking for a minus b which contains the element of a that are not in b so you always take it left to right so you think about an element which contain which exists in the set a but not in b so the difference between a and b is also called the complement of B with respect to I. Now, how is this happening? You could simply say now, U is basically the set or the element represented or existed in set A, and then you do the complement of A, which will end up, which will basically result on B in respect to, R, to A. Now, a minus B, you can define it as X, where X belongs to A, and, now the AND condition is important here because X should not be an element on B. So when you speak about it, imagine that you have a C, or you want to represent it in, in a diagram, you will find that a set A, and there is a set B. Now make the intersection, the intersection will be what? Will be the common factor between them. Now, anything outside this intersection, outside, will be basically applies to the rule of the difference. So, including the intersection, the common factor, because the common factor between A and B is basically not satisfying the rule. The rule said, I don't want an element to be exist in B. But any element common between A and B is existing B, so we cannot take it. So anything outside this, which is the A in the blue color you, you see the, here in the diagram, is basically the difference between A and B. <coughs> now with cardinality, where you have a union of two sets and you want to do the cardinality, you could simply use the same laws of logic, where we have the, the cardinality, of A 
union B is basically the cardinality of A plus the cardinality of B minus the common elements between A and B, the intersection between them. And you can verify this by the diagram. So let A be the math major in your class and B will be the CS major. You need to count how many numbers of students who are either math major or C majors and the number of math majors and the number of C majors and subtract the number will, which is basically the result of the join between CS, math and major. We will go back to this principle again, but this is just to give you the sense what we mean by cardinality. Now let me give you a few examples so you can practice all these relationships by yourself and you understand what we mean by them. The first one, just to review all of that, okay? So we have a set which is U and we have another set called A capital and B capital. Now, what is A union B? What are the merge between A and B? It will be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and I carry on. 4 and 5 appears already in A, so I don't need to repeat them. It will be 6, 7, and 8. Now, what is the intersection? Now you look for a common factor between A and B. So 4 and 5 are the common elements between A and B. Now what is the A complement? Now you take the U and you minus A out of U. You take all elements in A from the set U and you just put down the complement of A. So they are basically zero because not in A. We have 6, which is not in A. We have 7, 8, 9, and 10. Now, what is the B complement? Again, you do the same trick. You take any element which appear in B out of the set U capital, and you put down B prime. So this is, will be 0, 1, 2, 3, and as well, 9 and 10. Now, what we mean by the difference between A and B? What is the difference between, between A and B? Now, with the difference, we are looking for an element which is in A, but not in B. Not the common factor, the opposite of the common factor. So here we are looking for the values, which are 1, 2, 3. 1 is exist in A, but not, it does not exist in B. 2 exists in A, but it's not an element of B. 3 is an element of A, but it's not an element of B, and so on. Now take B minus A. What? So, sorry. Uh, yeah. So it means that A minus B means that the difference of A so, A from the first set, minus B. We're looking for the difference from the first set. Yes. The so the first set, set, the rules always start left to right. Mm -hmm. So the element that exists in A should not be existed on the right one, which is B, the, the next set. Now take the opposite, B minus A. Now we are looking for an element in B, and it is not in A. Again, what? what? Six. So six is an element of B, but it's not in A. Seven is an element of B, but it's not in A. Eight is not is an element of B. Exactly what you do minusing. You take the elements that in the right hand side from the equation. Just like minus works. Thank you.